Hello and welcome to our webinar series, Art and Architecture with Kurt D. Camillo. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical organization in the country, specializing in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Today, we'll look at the life and legacy of William Waldorf Astor through his lavish English country estates and Villa Astor on the Amalfi Coast. And if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question panel at any point during the presentation. We will answer as many as we can at the end. We're also recording this event, and starting later today, you'll be able to review uh, this presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. Our guide for today is Kurt D. Camillo, an inter internationally recognized authority on English country houses and the decorative arts. Kurt joined American Ancestors in February of 2016 as our first curator of special collections. In this role, Kurt provides strategic direction and expert guidance for organizing and exhibiting our extensive collection of family history related artifacts. He's also led highly successful heritage tours for our organization to England, Scotland, Ireland, and Italy, and has lectured extensively in the United States and abroad. Kurt was previously the executive director of the National Trust for Scotland Foundation USA. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kurt. Hello, everybody. Um, I think what you just witnessed was an example of heat. I think Ginevra had just been struck down by heat because God knows it is hideous today in Boston. It's beautiful and sunny, but it is so hot that it's just, it's no one should be allowed to go outside. This is something that I think that Johann Jacob Astor, you see here, probably never experienced because it never got that hot when he was living in New York. Or more importantly, as you can see here, when he came from Germany in 1783, and the town that he came from, Waldorf, is gonna be very important as we go forward in the future. But let's talk a little bit about some of the things that made um, John Jacob, which he later came to be called in his anglicized version, who he was. The first American multimillionaire. He owned over 100 acres of Manhattan. Just think of that, 100 acres. His Columbia River trading post at Fort Astoria was the very first community on the Pacific coast of the United States. And though he was a cranky old man most of his life, even when he was young, he did support financially and in other ways, John James Audubon in his studies and his artwork and his travels around the world. So we're very grateful to him for that. The man we're gonna talk about today is his great grandson, William Waldorf Astor, who you see here. Um, so William Waldorf was in 1890, when his father died, he became the richest man in the world, mainly because of this um, 100 acres of Manhattan that he inherited. He was a very unusual man. And as we'll see and, and um, give you lots of examples of throughout this talk today, the thing is he admired lots of unusual people. And one of those was Mad Ludwig, more formally known as Ludwig II of Bavaria. And you can see it when I was putting this book together, I was sort of taken aback by how much they looked like each other when they were younger. And um, we'll get back to Mad Ludwig in a second, but let's talk a little bit more about William Waldorf after himself. He really was an unusual man. He was an only child, which I think probably explains a lot. You can see here, he grew up in Germany and Italy. He heard Liszt play in person. He spoke a number of languages. He said this himself at the age of 18, his German tutor, introduced him to Greek philosophy, which he later compared to the conversion of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. He attended Columbia Law. He practiced for only one year. He ran for New York State Assembly and be elected that office and then became a New York State Senator. He was not comfortable in any of these roles. He didn't like being a lawyer. He didn't like being a politician. As you can see in 1881, he unsuccessfully ran for a position in the US House. He was very thin skinned. Um, he did not like criticism. He was not comfortable, in my opinion, in his own skin. He probably had the highest achievement in his professional life in 1882 when um, President Chester Arthur appointed him as the United States ambassador to Italy. And just a few years later, he wrote this novel you see here, Valentino, in 1885. Um, Valentino is 
an interesting thing. It's really hard to read. It's very dense, but it's sort of a love letter to Cesare Borgia, which is a hard man to love if you read about the Borgias. Um, but what's interesting is that I think what Chester Arthur did for him was give him the seeds of the love of his life, which was Italy. And everything that he recreated, I think, was based on Italy. And he felt that's where his place was. He did always hold this strange uh, attraction for um, Italian despots and um, women in distress throughout history. And we'll see more of that later as well. He married in 1878, uh, Mary Paul from a prominent Philadelphia family. And you can see both of them here. She died young. I think she was 36 when she died. And she gave him five children. He never really completely recovered from her death and um, never remarried. And part of, I think, of his later isolation and his loneliness was because of her loss. But she was alive when he was the ambassador to Italy. And because he was so rich and because the United States did not have an official ambassador's residence in Rome, he rented a palazzo um, of the Borghese family. You see here the Palazzo Vespicchiosi, um, which sits on the site of the Baths of Constantine in Rome. And he entertained um, lavishly, paid for all again at his own expense. He was a favorite of the king and queen of Italy because um, he spoke Italian and because he was so, um, I think, so respectful of their, their heritage. But what's really important for the future of him and his designs are the gardens here at the Palazzo. And this is a photograph of them in his time. And they look actually very similar to that today. So keep this in your mind. We'll get back to this later um, because so much of who he was and many designs, I think, was based on his, his time living here. So while he was the ambassador, he became friendly with this man um, who looks like <laughs> what he was, which is a bit of a charlatan, Attilio Simonetti, who had a gallery, as you can see here, the Galleria Simonetti in Rome. And he sold um, ancient art, ancient fragments, mainly sculptures from ancient Rome. Um, and you can see this great view looking down. He had this entire courtyard where you could come and peruse and you could see all these various things for sale. But here in the upper right, where that arrow is, you can see the workshop. And I put here in quotes where um, his workers were reassembling marble fragments. So what that means is he's taking bits and pieces things that were probably ancient and then having his workmen um add maybe 60 or 70 percent of missing pieces and selling them as ancient and we think that he actually took in william waldorf Astor and sold him a number of pieces that probably weren't genuine but we also know that he came to respect Astor um, as a real connoisseur not just a rich man who was collecting and we think he started to favor him because he respected his knowledge and his love of Italy but also I think probably and I don't know this for a fact it's just my suspicion that he he wanted to keep a good customer happy and he was probably afraid that um, Astor could find out that he was selling him reconstructions the other thing that I think is interesting as well is to compare who he was competing against. I say who, I mean, William Waldorf Astor. He was living the same time period as other great collectors like J.P. Morgan and William Randolph Hearst, both of whom have a much bigger legacy today because they both left behind museums of one sort or another for us, and Astor did not. Um, but Astor, and I think this is what um, you see here, Simonetti, he realized that Astor was not just a rich man, who had a job and then wanted to collect big things to impress his other rich friends. This is a man who was truly passionate and knew this stuff backward and forward because this was his life. He never really worked. I mean, he managed his family's money, but he didn't work. He really understood art. And speaking of managing his family's money, there was so much of it that he had to form his own trust company, the Astor Trust Company. And this is the building that he built. Um, it's it's rather astonishing um, because you, this is a photograph I took probably about five years ago of the very same building today. It's still there. Um, it still says Astor Trust Company here. And this is interesting because you could not open an account here. This was a trust company whose only role was to manage the Astor family money. That's how much money it was. And it's right across the street from um, the main branch of the New York Public Library, which of course uh, was partially called the Astor Library, so it's rather convenient as well. So let's talk about New York society. Now, this is this is his aunt, um, Caroline Astor. She was the Mrs. Astor. 
and um, she ruled over New York society. Now, this was a problem in 1890 when William Waldorf's father died, because William Waldorf thought, quite keeping with tradition, that as the eldest male in the main branch of the family, he and his wife would be the leaders of New York society. But Mrs. Astor here, who was married to William Waldorf's younger father's younger brother, he considered to be junior. She refused to give up the title of entertaining. She snubbed uh, Mrs. Astor, William Waldorf's wife, and um, a great feud began. She's really important because um, she was sort of the doyen of New York society in more than just one way. This is her townhouse, her first house on Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. And though it looks very unimpressive from the outside, it had, because it doesn't stand anymore, of course, it had a um, a ballroom that held 400 people in it, approximately. And it's from there that we have the, the first usage of the phrase, the 400. And um, Ward McAllister very famously said, the only 400 people that matter in New York society can fit in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. And I believe, once again, I have no proof of this, that when Forbes magazine started doing their list of the annual list of the 400 richest Americans, it had to be because they were basing it on Mrs. Astor's 400. So what does William Waldorf do? So he, he wants to really piss off his aunt. His father and his father's brother had houses that were conjoined. And what William Waldorf does is that he pulls down his father's house and builds a hotel, the Waldorf, which you see here in 1893. Um, and so his aunt's house is next door and it had the desired effect. It was loud, it was noisy. She couldn't stand living there, she moved. But he wanted to also make a statement that he created the most luxurious hotel in New York. And you can see here um, from one of the interiors, um, this was something that had never been seen in New York society before, a restaurant or interiors of any kind on this level. I mentioned earlier about uh, Mad Ludwig. You can see here, um, this was a, an attempt on William Waldorf to imitate some of the rooms of Ludwig's palace in Munich. Um, and this guy is hugely influential. I'm sure everybody knows his most famous house, Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria, which you see here, the most visited castle um, in Germany. And this, of course, was the model for Walt Disney when he created Cinderella's Castle at Walt Disney World. Now, <laughs> Mrs. Astor moves down to a much nicer part of Park Avenue, and her son takes over the feud. And he pulls down his mother's house and builds a bigger hotel, the Astoria, right next door to the Waldorf. And this had even greater interiors, even fancier, more. The idea was to outspend each other. In 1897, um, the feud is temporarily drawn to a, to a close and the two hotels merge and we get the Waldorf Astoria. And you can see how small the original Waldorf was right here. That was it. And you see how much bigger the Astoria was. And I'm sure many people um, remember, as I do, the famous Peacock Alley which connected the lobbies of the two hotels. It was almost a thousand feet long. And this was for a generation, the place to be seen in New York society, a walking Peacock Alley. It was so long that people would promenade just to be seen, even if they weren't using the hotel for any other reason. And the influence of the Waldorf in its early years um, cannot be overestimated. So we have um, Oscar of the Waldorf, the famous head of the hotel in 1896, published a famous book, the cookbook, by Oscar of the Waldorf that had recipes that he invented, that he invented at the Waldorf. Waldorf salad, of course, eggs Benedict and Thousand Island dressing. Then we come to um, the 20th century and um, the Waldorf is past its prime and it's sort of running down in its luck. It's getting old and worn down. And so what you see in this next photograph is um, it just before it was demolished in 1929 and what rose on its spot. That would be this, the Empire State Building. So of course, we all know that the Waldorf migrated to Park Avenue and the Waldorf that certainly that I'm familiar with is one I think most of you are familiar with, which is this lovely scene here. Um, 
it's now owned by the Chinese and it's undergoing a billion dollar restoration. I don't think it's going to open for another couple of years, but it's supposed to be spectacular when it does. I think it has the most famous um, hotel lobby in New York and not the grandest, not the fanciest, but the most famous, the one that just seems to just radiate New York. And it has in the middle a very famous clock. And I want to talk a little about a little bit about this clock because I think it's really interesting. It was commissioned by Queen Victoria to symbolize the friendship between the United States and Britain, specifically for Britain to exhibit at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. John Jacob Astor IV, now that would be the son of Mrs. Astor, the one who had the feud, he purchased this and put it in the new Waldorf Astoria lobby. It tells the time um, in New York, Paris, and Greenwich. Greenwich, of course, being the Greenwich in England, not the, not the one in New York. What I find really interesting about this is that the base is adorned with eight busts, eight, um, six presidents. Queen Victoria, we expect that, she commissioned it, and then Benjamin Franklin. And I, being a native Philadelphian and an admirer of Franklin, find this so interesting because he, this frequently happens with Franklin. He's grouped in with presidents and he was never a president. He never really had political office. And it's very interesting. And you can see him right here in this photograph on the far left there with, with Washington in the middle and um, Abraham Lincoln to the right. This is also being restored. It's supposedly at a cost of a million dollars and will be reappearing in the new um, William, the new William Waldorf, the new Waldorf Astoria. So John Jacob Astor the fourth, who bought this clock, who really made the Waldorf Astoria what it was. Um, Mrs. Astor's son, as I mentioned, you can see here, just to give a reminder, um, this was somebody that um, had a privileged background and really was not probably the nicest person. Um, I think Ginevra is going to give you a photograph of him and next to his mother. And something else that he did, he owned a number of hotels. He built a hotel that doesn't exist anymore called the Knickerbocker. And he sunk on the Titanic. He sunk in the Titanic. He went down with the Titanic. That's his big claim to fame. He is one of those, those men that supposedly, um, when they realized that it was going down, said, I'm going to die like a gentleman and put on their evening clothes and, you know, went down with dignity. Um, I mentioned that he also was a big hotelier in New York. And the Knickerbocker, he went to one of the artists at the time, Maxfield Parrish, and commissioned this, this very famous mural of old King Cole. Um, and this was actually for his Knickerbocker Hotel. And when that was demolished, it was moved to the St. Regis in 1932. And what you see here is the King Cole Bar, the St. Regis, one of the most famous bars in New York City. And all comes around in this wonderful Maxfield Parish painting and something that William Walter Faster could never have done because he didn't have the kind of taste like this. John Jacob was a little younger and he had um, a more fashion forward taste and he patronized artists like Maxfield Parrish. So our guy, William Waldorf, lost the battle with his aunt and with her son. And they won New York Society. His wife never ascended to the lofty position that he thought she should have. So he decides that he's going to leave America permanently. And he says very famously, America is not a fit place for a gentleman to live. He moves to Britain. He gives up his American citizenship, becomes a Brit. And this was actually considered a snub by um, American society because you have the richest man in the world who's an American who says, I don't want to be an American. So you see here in 1916, um, the Chicago Tribune doing this, this front page story of William Waldorf Astor, super snob, um, sort of ridiculing him for moving to the UK and making fun of him as well. Because you look in this bottom left, you can see the fat German butcher's um, apprentice that was his um, his great grandfather, and then the progression of the various Astors, ending with William Waldorf over here, um, wearing the coronet of a Viscount of Great Britain, because of course he was ennobled as well. And when he moved initially to the UK, he rented a house in Berkeley Square in London that's still there today, called Lansdowne House, um, owned by the Marquis of Lansdowne, who needed the money, so he le leased it out to William Waldorf. I'm sure many of you know that this house, though greatly reduced in size, still survives today. It's now the Lansdowne Club. And this is actually the very same facade that you see here on the left, which is a travesty. Um, the house was primarily designed by Robert Adam, the great 18th century British architect. 
And when they truncated the size of it in the 1930s, they sold a number of rooms away. And what are considered to be probably the two most important 18th century English period rooms in America were sold. And the most impressive of them is in Philadelphia. This is, of course, it's the drawing room from Lansdowne House, which I think it just makes me want to swoon. And almost as impressive is the dining room, which is at the Met. And you see that here. And I think that one of the things that Astor would have loved about the dining room in particular, but the house in general, is that the then um, Lord Lansdowne had one of the most important collections in private hands in the world of ancient Greek and Roman statues. Sadly, all those were sold off, but when Astor would have rented it, they would have all still been there. What you see here, what the Met has, are primarily plaster reproductions in those niches, because these niches were designed specifically to hold this important collection of ancient sculpture. So just a brief word about the man that the house is named after, the first Marcos of Lansdowne, you see here, he was um, prime minister of Great Britain during the American War of Independence. And he's the one who in 1783 drew up this document, the Treaty of Paris, which ended the American War of Independence. And you can see right there um, the signatures of John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, um, which to me, this is a seminal document for American history. The room where he drew it up is still there. It's now a bar. <laughs> it's called the Round Room Bar. Um, at the Lansdowne Club, but I love the fact that it's still there and it's still recognized as such. So William Waldorf knows the way to sort of make himself felt in a new country. So because he has so much money, he decides to become a player in the London social scene. He buys on the Pall Mall Gazette in 1892 and pumps enormous amounts of money into it and creates the greatest evening paper in London. And this is at a time, of course, when newspapers were the way you communicated with people. Um, because of his experience building the Waldorf Hotel, he um, builds a new hotel, which shockingly is still in the West End of London today, and it's still called the Waldorf. And he it, it's just amazing how much he gave to his adopted country, and he was generous beyond doing things for himself. He also was very instrumental in the, the, um, the National Gallery trying to save this Titian for the nation, man with a quilted sleeve. And he gave an enormous amount of money to help the National Gallery buy this and, and to keep it where it is today, one of the great treasures of the National Gallery. So his whole idea when he rented Lansdowne House is it was a temporary home for a few years while he built his own townhouse in London. And this is what he built, Astor House. Um, there's nothing else quite like it in London. It's um, it's hard to describe. We're going to see a little bit about it, and you'll get your own feelings for it. You can see that the Manchester Garden Guardian today, simply the Guardian, called it the Petit Palais of the Embankment. It's a combination of a Jacobean Tudor manor house plop down in London. He was, in spite of all of this, in spite of his um, desertion of America, he was very proud of being an American. And so this house has all kinds of reminders of his Americanness, starting with this weather vane. And the weather vane um, is very specific. It's one thing in particular, which is a ship. It's a gilded ship, and it's the Santa Maria. And this is his way of saying, and the reason it's so big is just to remind people that an American lived in this house. And this, of course, was the flagship of this man who had two other ships. And all three of them together, in the simplest of terms, discovered this. And this is something that you see um, William Waldorf Astor coming back to again and again. And you see it in a more subtle way when you come into the half courtyard that is the entranceway. So you can see the front door right there where that arrow is. And then these two lamp posts on either side of the door. These also have um, bits of American symbolism and American achievement in them. The, the puti that hold up these are holding up um, examples of American inventions. That is a very early light bulb. And of course, that was um, first brought about by Thomas Edison. And here on the right, you have the other puti who's talking on a telephone. And William Waldorf Astor considered Alexander Graham Bell an American, even though he was a Scot, because by the time he invented the telephone, he'd become a naturalized American citizen. The other thing that William Waldorf Astor was, was a gearhead. He loved technology. So when this was built, it was unusual to have a telephone or electricity in your house. And this is another way of bragging of the cool things that he had. From his time in Italy, he came away with a lot of knowledge about Italian marbles and colored stones. 
And um, Italy has more colored stones than any other spot on the planet that can be mined. And he had a very big hand in designing the entrance hall that you see here um, and giving a richness of Italian stones. So for instance, if we zoom in on the fireplace here, that white marble is a rare form of Carrera marble that has really big, thick black veins in it. That's what makes it rare. You can look down at that floor and you can see there are over 23 different hard stones in here. This is um, a red jasper. Up here, we have a green onyx. And these are things that he could, took great delight in creating. And it is sort of a cacophony of colors. If you go to the upper part of this hall, which goes up against this incredible stained glass ceiling, um, you can see the symbolism of America coming out again and his love of all things literature. So for instance, that frieze right there, there are 82 characters carved in there, very specific characters from Shakespeare's plays. And then the American bit, these columns have symbols um, from American fiction, Rip Van Winkle, Hester Prynne, characters from The Last of the Mohicans. The other thing that's cool about these columns is that normally when you have columns like this in a house, certainly in the 19th and 20th centuries, and even in the 18th, actually, you would have a hollow wood column that would have a steel pole or would have stone or brick inside of it that was the real support. But not William Walter or Vasto. These are solid mahogany columns. And everything about this house, everything he did everywhere, actually, is the best and the most expensive. And in this house, which only had one bedroom, it was his bedroom, um, and he was the only person who lived here, and it was mainly his office. This was the headquarters of his world empire. So his office had to be really grand. And this is a photograph of his office from when he was still alive, what we call the Great Hall today, 71 feet long, 28 feet wide. The ceilings are 35 feet tall. And there are five windows there on the left that look out over the Thames. And right in the middle there, that's his desk with those really cool griffins holding it up. Um, and he was super conscious of being um, kidnapped. He was always afraid of his safety because he was so rich. So he had really sophisticated systems put in here for all kinds of things to protect himself. And there was a secret button in this desk that he could push that locked all the doors in the house at once from the inside and the outside. He had um, incredible security put in, alarms that were way ahead of their time. This still exists and it almost looks the same today. Here's a photograph of it today. And you can see the richness of the wood that's here. Um, the thing, <laughs> I'm laughing because this is so aster. Um, he loved, loved everything English, so he wanted to have a copy of a medieval hammer beam English ceiling. Hammer beam ceilings, which were an invention of the English, um, were almost always made from, from English oak. But of course, this is William Waldorf Astor we're talking about. So his is made from solid Spanish mahogany. And you can see those brackets coming out there. He has 12 gilded statues with characters from Ivanhoe. Once again, a reminder of the American side of who he is. Down here, on the left, we have one of his two stained glass windows he commissioned. We're gonna zoom in on that on the next slide. This is um, sunrise, 11 feet by nine feet. And it has a fictional depiction of an imaginary medieval Swiss scene. And of course, if you have a sunrise window, you have to have a sunset window. And the other end of the hall is the sunset window. Now, what's interesting about this is that this was commented on a lot in London society when the house was revealed to the public because this was not the kind of stained glass you would see at the time. You would see William Morris. You would see things that were, you had the avant-garde coming in the style. But what this was, was very much a product of who William Waldorf Astor was. He was a product of New York society at the time of Edith Wharton and Newport. And those houses would have had stained glass windows like this in them. I mentioned before about his love of women who have had um, difficult times. This door, the door, the main door to his office um, is very much evocative of that. It has nine panels, each with a, a gilded bronze figure of a woman from Arthurian legend. And right in the middle there is um, Guinevere seated on a throne. Um, this door weighed two tons. Um, once again, this was meant to be sort of bomb proof because he was afraid of being killed. He also was afraid of civil insurrection and built the largest vault 
in Europe after the Bank of England's in the basement. This is not it. This is a photograph that I took off the web. Um, and in the vault, he had gold bars, cash, and heaps of jewelry, things that could be taken very quickly in time of um, civil unrest and he could get out of the country with. Now, of course, in British society, if you want to be accepted, you have to have a country house. And this is the house that he bought. This is Cliveden House. He paid about $167 million in inflation adjusted values for it in 1893. Um, it had always been owned by aristocrats, people with titles. And when it was sold, Queen Victoria very famously said, it's grievous to think of it falling into these hands. And it's probably not so much that um, he was an untitled person, but that he was an American and that he would come in with this money and ruin things. I want to show you the positioning of it because it's this wonderful house in Buckinghamshire, about probably about five miles from Windsor. It sits really high um, on a hill overlooking the Thames. And it was built in the 1666, a rather auspicious year, for the Duke of Buckingham. And you can actually see here um, what the house looked like when it was originally built. And uh, it was designed by this man, William Wind, who was also hired by the Duke of Buckingham to create a house in London for him, which of course was called Buckingham House. You can see how similar these two buildings look, very much of the style of the 17th century. And of course, Buckingham House looks like this today, because inside Buckingham Palace, in bits and pieces, is that original Buckingham House. This is a wonderful 19th century imaginary portrait of um, called The Life of Buckingham that, that was done in 1855 and is now at Yale. And it shows the Duke of Buckingham there on the right with Charles II, his king. And this is inside Cliveden House, a, a debauched dinner party. And we can actually recognize some of the furniture that's in here. Why the Duke, I think, is important beyond his taste and his erudition was that he was the B in cabal. So we have this word cabal, which means basically a group of, um, a small group of people who control things. And during Charles II's reign, there was this group of men, all aristocratic men, and you can see where the cabal comes from. Almost all of them had titles, the Duke of Buckingham, the Earl of Lauderdale, and their initials together came to cabal. And they basically ruled in Charles's name in, in every single way you can think of. By the 18th century, um, the Buckinghams had sold Cliveden, and it was let to um, Frederick, the Prince of Wales, who was the father of George III. Frederick, who died before he became king, is considered by most historians to be the most refined of all the Hanoverian kings, um, the most erudite. He loved music. You can see him here at Kew Palace um, with his sisters playing music. He also was a patron of artists, he formed great art collections and a patron of composers. This is the relatively obscure English composer called Thomas Arne, who um, Frederick hired to write a great mask, an opera, um, to celebrate the greatest medieval king in English history. And that of course would be Alfred the Great. And to premiere this mask, he decided to have it outside at Cliveden. And this is actually a ticket that I was really lucky to get a few years ago on eBay. This is a ticket from 1740. Um, and you can see Clifton House in the background of the ticket and you have Hyman and Cupid symbolizing culture in the front. And you would have presented this ticket to come in to the grounds. And what's cool about Clifton is that it has a natural amphitheater there. And this is the house, what it looked like at the time that this would have premiered. And there were a number of follies, little garden buildings built around this natural amphitheater that the great and the good would have heard the performance from, and this is the um, the Blenheim Pavilion from there. So this is hugely important to almost everyone who speaks English, and I'm sure almost nobody knows where this little ditty that Geneva's going to play for you in a second came from, and that's because it was part of this this mask called Alfred, and it was part of the symbolism of Britain having an empire and ruling the seas. And I certainly think for those of us of a certain age in America, it is the very personification in music of Britain. And as you'll see, um, Wagner thought the same thing too. Now, 
I actually have goosebumps. I'm not kidding. Just after hearing that, it just it does it to me every time. For all and the good and the bad of Empire, it just gets me all yummy inside. So now let's talk about his garden design, because this is something else that William Waldorf Astor was ahead of his time in. He created what we believe is the very first Asian garden in British soil. And you can see that little um, bit there on the right, that little folly. He bought that from Lord Hartford's Bagatelle in Paris in 1906, brought it back here to Clifton and created this early garden that was based on Asian precepts. It really, of course, was not Asians as the, it was not be considered Asians by someone who's Chinese, but it was the idea that Europeans thought of an Asian garden. He loved sculpture, William Waldorf did, and he hired an important American sculptor called Thomas Waldo Story to create the Fountain of Love, which you see here, which is on the entrance when you come to Cliveden today. And Story also tutored um, William Waldorf, and he created his own sculpture called Wounded Amazon, which still is in the gardens today at Cliveden, and I think is pretty damn good for a rich person. And then he collected so much from ancient Rome and then just dotted them all through the grounds at Clifton. So this is probably a first century BC sarcophagus. There are quite a few of these around the gardens at Clifton. And he had the largest parterre in Europe built in, in the backyard at Clifton. You can see a view of it here. But what's really important is this unimpressive looking balustrade that down here, because he probably bribed Vatican officials to get this out of Italy, because this is the balustrade that came from the Villa Borghese in Rome, which you see here. And would even then it was suspect that it would ever leave because it's considered a national treasure of Italy. And of course the Italians, not surprisingly, won it back. He did beautiful gardens in a um, very French style. You see the long garden here. This I took probably about five or six years ago when we were staying at Clifton for a tour we did. I mean, you just look at that. This is taken at probably about 7.30 at night. Oh, this is why the English summers are just so wonderful. I mean, you just walk down there and just walk into happiness forever. Because this is a great estate, there are all kinds of follies. And this is an 18th century garden temple, an octagon um, that was built to have summer lunches in. And um, William Waldorf Astor turned it into a chapel and to a mausoleum. And he is buried here. His ashes are here. And I think five other members um, of the family are also buried here as well, which is interesting because this course is today a hotel. And you can actually visit these um, places. And I took this photograph about nine o'clock at night, believe it or not. You go inside and what William Waldorf did is he Edwardenized these these homes. So he took what was originally here. Everything you're going to see now was him. So he created the great hall from a series of two or three smaller rooms. All this paneling was installed by him. But because he loves the idea of bringing fragments in, you have this amazing um, 16th century fireplace from Burgundy that he established here. And then, of course, there's this great John Singer Sargent portrait of his daughter-in-law. Nancy Astor, and we have to talk about her for just a few minutes. So um, Nancy Astor was a force of nature. She was very opinionated. She was very loud. She was a teetotaler. She was very religious, and she was in Church of England. And she wanted everybody, and I mean everybody, to know her opinions, and she wanted to change your opinions. And when I was researching this book originally, I was the more I read about her, they're like, wow especially when I came across her maiden name, which of course was Langhorn. And all I could think of was this character from fiction, Foghorn Langhorn, who was just the same, who was loud and Southern. She was from Virginia um, and just knew everything. And that's how Nancy Astor was. She was not somebody you messed with. She's also the very first woman ever to serve in parliament. Um, she had a lot of problems, and we'll talk about some of those a little later on, but she was um, and she was definitely not a feminist. She was conservative, but she she was an interesting character. This is her husband, Waldorf Astor, um, the second Viscount Astor. He was the eldest son of William Waldorf, and you can see um, William was the first Viscount Astor. And this is important because you're going to see in this next photograph um, a coronet of a Viscount of Great Britain. William Waldorf Astor was the very first native-born American ever to be given a peerage um, by a British sovereign, which in and of itself is pretty impressive. He did not like many people, William Waldorf Astor. He was suspicious of people. He liked his daughter-in-law, 
a lot. And he gave her, um, one of the things he gave her for a wedding gift was not just this tiara, but this amazing diamond that was set in the front of it, the, the Sancy diamond, 55 carat yellow diamond that we think came from India in the 14th century. It was originally in the crown jewels of France. It was stolen during the French Revolution. And um, he had it, as you oftentimes did with valuable stones and tiaras, um, mounted there so you could take it off and wear it as a pendant as well. So you, you couldn't wear a tiara every day of the week. It very sadly, I shouldn't say sadly, it was sold, I think in 1978, um, by the family, by the Astor family to the Louvre for a million dollars, which was a lot of money in 1958. And that's where it is today. Nancy Astor, um, as I said, was an unusual woman. She was a very strong in everything she did. Um, her, her staff quit on her repeatedly and then oftentimes would come back. She was harsh. She was loud. But something she did today that you don't see, something she did in her day that you don't see today in politics, this is her at Clifton with Charlie Chaplin. That's her in the middle. And that's George Bernard Shaw on the right. Now, what's interesting about this is that George Bernard Shaw was a socialist. Charlie Chaplin was, let's not talk about Charlie Chaplin's bedroom escapades. But what's interesting about this is these two men were diametrically opposed to her political views. But she had them over as well as Winston Churchill, who was the same party as, as she was, but she hated his politics. And she still had them over for dinner at Cliveden regularly. And she believed the only way to get through tough times was to talk about the, the issues of the day with people with whom you disagreed. And that's something I think is very sadly missing from us. Now, her blind spot, the Cliveden set. This is a phrase that has a very derogatory phrase um, meaning to us today. This is a 1938 cartoon from a London paper um, showing what Nancy Astor was all about. She was a sympathizer of Germany before the war. And she, um, you can see her here giving a Heil Hitler salute. Behind her there is um, a poster of von Ribbentrop. He was the then the German ambassador to Britain. He was a friend of hers. He came and spent many weekends at Cliveden. You can see every one of these people is a real person. That's George Bernard Shaw down there crawling. Um, right here in the front, that's the Marquess of Lothian, who is a friend of hers. He was um, the man who started what's called the country houses scheme for the National Trust. He gave the very first house the trust ever received, Blickling Hall, to the National Trust. You can see her friends over here on the far left reading Mein Kampf. So the, one of the reasons that she hated um, Churchill so much was because he was the one, as I'm sure you all know, that was preaching during what was called the wilderness years for him, the danger of Churchill. I mean, I'm sorry, the danger of Hitler. And she, of course, believed that, that Hitler was going to be Britain's best friend. And of course, there's nothing that makes any of us matter than being wrong and having someone else be right. And we know that it was at Cliveden that this famous exchange took place between Nancy and Churchill when Nancy was looking at him eating dinner and she was just so mad at what he was saying. She said, sir, if you were my husband, I'd poison your tea. And he very famously, being Winston Churchill, said in reply, madam, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. So during the war itself, which she once she realized that Hitler was not good, she did buckle down and support the war effort. And because she was so well connected, she knew everybody. You can see here um, during the war, that's Princess Elizabeth, later Queen Elizabeth on the far left. That's her mother, the Queen Mother. That's Princess Margaret. And that's Nancy Astor. Now, Princess Margaret, I'm sure you all know, was not anybody you trifle with. She was one tough nut. She said the only person she was ever afraid of in her whole life was Nancy Astor. And I totally believe that. So sadly, it was at Cliveden that the most notorious scandal in British political history took place. It's They say in the UK, it's the standard by which all other um, scandals are judged. And it's sort of the Watergate of the UK. And of course, it was called the Profumo Affair. And it centered around this man who John Profumo, who was the basically the um, Secretary of Defense between 1960 and 1963, he was having um, an affair. And in 1961, at the swimming pool you see right here at Clifton House, um, he met this model, Christine Keeler, who you see here. And she was probably a high price call girl. He didn't know that, or he pretended not to. And um, what he didn't know 
is that she was also having an affair with a Russian spy who was based in London. And there's the supposition that secrets were shared by John Perfumo that were passed on by her to this guy. And when this all came out into the public, there was a big brouhaha. And in 1963, the whole government fell, the government of Harold Macmillan. Um, John Perfumo did something that isn't done anymore. He sacrificed himself and said, I was wrong. He admitted everything. He retired from politics and spent 40 years doing charity work. This is what he looked like just before he died at the age of 91. He looks like something out of central casting for a British eccentric. And he didn't just do charity work. He, he scrubbed toilets for 40 years. Now, it helps to be able to be this to be this good, kind person that he was, that he was independently wealthy, so he didn't need to work. But still, an amazing thing. Now, the um, the Astors decided after this, after the Perfume Affair, that they just really couldn't live, lived anymore. There's just too many bad memories here. During the war, um, they had donated the house to the National Trust together with about $10 million in cash in inflation-adjusted terms as an endowment. And with the agreement that they, the family, could continue to live there as long as they wanted to. But after the Perfume Affair, they moved out and they never came back. And the National Trust didn't know what to do with it, so they leased it to this organization. And this, of course, is Stanford. And this became Stanford's campus abroad in the 19, late 60s and the 1970s. And you can see here um, the drawing room as it was as the library for Stanford. And you can see that very same image today. This is um, terrace dining room as this gorgeously reborn space has now become. And you can, if you want to spend an enormous amount of money, thousands of dollars a night, you can actually stay in Nancy Astor's bedroom, which you see right here. So, of course, if you give this house, and that's what he did, William Aldorf Astor gave Clifton as a wedding gift to his son and to Nancy Astor, you need another country house for yourself. And he decided somebody else he admired a lot was um, this man, who actually ended up looking like this. And of course, was very fond of um, male bravado and um, everything that goes with it, as you can see from his suit of armor here. And of course, as a bit of background, it's because of Henry VIII and his um, desire to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who you see here, that we have today the Church of England. And of course, in America, we call that the Episcopal Church. And the reason, of course, for all of this was so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. You see um, the great scholar Susanna Lipscomb calls the most influential and important queen consort England has ever had. So she was very attractive to Henry for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that she was very sophisticated, particularly for her time. She um, lived um, at the court of Francis I, Francois I, at the Chateau de Bois in the Loire Valley. She was unusual for an aristocratic woman of her time that she spoke multiple languages. She was educated, which was very unusual for a woman. We're almost sure that while she was living in Bois that she met Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Leonardo retired to die at the court of Francis I. And it's almost certain that she saw in Leonardo's presence the most famous painting in the world, the Mona Lisa, because that's the reason that the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre today is because when Leonardo retired to France, he brought this painting with him. So she comes back to England after her time in France and she's incredibly sophisticated and she refuses to have sex with Henry, which drives him nuts, of course, because he's a man. And he took her out hunting. She could hunt. She did all these things. She was very much a proto-feminist for her time, but she still refused to have sex. She said, you marry me or you get nothing. And that's, of course, why the divorce took place. He showered her with gifts. This is my favorite of the gifts. This is a solid gold whistle pendant. You wore this around your neck. And up here, that first area is you blew that to call your servants. But of course, this was a practical device as well. So you had this little thing here on the left where you could pick your teeth. And my favorite thing of all, on the right, you could use this to take wax out of your ears. I think there's nothing that says I love you like wax. So... Where she grew up is where our friend comes next. So this is Anne Boleyn's childhood home, Hever Castle in Kent. Has a medieval core. 
William Waldorf buys it in 1903, knowing that he's going to give Clifton to his son when he gets married. As I said to you earlier, William Waldorf loved um, women that had sort of doomed histories around them. So I'm sure one of the reasons he bought Heaver was because it was Anne Boleyn's childhood home. But it's small as castles go. It was too small for him. He did something that was really rare at the time. He respected the original architecture and he built what is called the Tudor village, which you see here on the left. So this is a moated castle. In order to make this work without offending the original architecture, he built a bridge over the moat and you see there in the middle, that's the original castle. Everything to the right and behind it is the Tudor village, over 100 rooms. Now, this has a six, 13th century core, this, this castle. This is the oldest working portcullis in England, 13th century. So that means the 1200s. And because he was so conscious of theft and kidnapping, this portcullis was lowered every night when William Waldorf lived here. And that's why he liked the fact that it was moated too, it made him feel a little bit safer. Because this is the only thing that's left from the 13th century castle, the portcullis, most of it was rebuilt during the time um, that the Blinds were here. If you look in that middle courtyard there, that's where we're gonna go next, because this is the house that the Blinds built in the middle of the castle. And this looks very much like you would expect a Tudor house to look. By the time William Waldorf Astor bought Heaver, it had been used as a farmhouse and animals lived in it. So he had to rebuild almost all of the interiors. And you see here in the entrance hall, I mean, he was very good at trying to replicate things, but this is very much an Edwardian recreation and very much, I think, evocative of the time in which William Waldorf Astor lived. One of the greatest rooms, as far as collections go, in this house is the library. Now, this does not look that impressive, really. It's a, it's a library, clearly. The ceiling is copied from a ceiling in Hampton Court Palace. The bookcases are copies of Samuel Pepys' bookcases that... Um, astonishing for the, the, the relevance to the history. But then he had 2,500 books, all of them rare, and they're all still there today. And he had them all bound in his own leather. And he had his book plate put in each of them. And this is the book plate, which I think is important to dissect because of what it shows of his heritage and what he was proud of. So on the left, you see Native American. On the right, you see a fur trapper because that's where the, where the Astor fortune started, really with furs, and then it moved to real estate. And then in the middle, you see the um, coronet of a Marquis, because he was, of course, a Marquis of Great Britain. And because he wanted this to not just be a library, but be a library that spoke to what Heaver Castle was, he bought books that were associated with the castle. So this is Anne Boleyn's own book of hours, and it's still in the Heaver Castle Library today. Um, what's amazing about this, a book of hours, of course, is a very small book that you kept with you and you said the hours um, at various points of the day of, of the, um, the Catholic religion. What's so cool about this is right down here in the bottom, we actually have in her own hand, Anne's handwriting. And I think that probably really meant an enormous amount to William Waldorf Astor. So I mentioned earlier about um, the Palazzo Rospigliosi um, and how influential it was in the formation of William Waldorf Astor's gardens. We're gonna see that particularly now at Heaver. So this is a reminder of what he saw there. And this is the very first thing he creates when he comes to Heaver is the Italian loggia. So that's an artificial lake. It took 800 men to build that lake. He had so many men working, there weren't enough men in the, in the neighborhood. So he had special trains every morning that came down from London to build this loggia and this lake to go with it. He wanted a fountain because, of course, that's what you have if you love everything Italy. So this is the fountain that was created. This was modeled on one of the most famous fountains in the world, the Trevi Fountain in Rome. And they did something that was pretty unique for the time, which is the gardens themselves were populated with bits and pieces that he'd brought back from Renaissance Italy and ancient Italy. So you see here, for instance, um, this is a Renaissance wellhead from Venice. And we're gonna go through a number of these things relatively quickly. These are just bits and pieces from ancient Rome that he positioned as we see them today, all around these gardens. Um, everything is old, columns, stones. He had such an eye. And this is, this is like, these are all museum quality pieces out in the gardens, which it's just astonishing all by itself. It just gives me goosebumps again. When um, I was taking these photographs, I could hear running water. I'm very attracted to the sound of water. And he created this cascade. 
And it, it just sort of draws you in. It, it's just this amazing um, sense of presence that it has. And that I think is symbolic to lead us into his ultimate creation, I think, which was the last year, because this is a place that's surrounded by water um, in Sorrento in the Bay of Naples. You can see the background of this house. Um, originally, there's a house here that was built for the grandson of the first emperor, Augustus. It became a convent in the Middle Ages, which is how it was saved. The Catholic Church, bad as they have been in so many ways, did save an awful lot by turning places of worship from pagan times into Christian worship, and the gardens were saved. Then it became a private residence, and then in 1905, it was bought by him. And what you see here, clinging to this incredible cliff looking over the Bay of Naples, um, is a house that he built. There were houses here, as you read in the past, but he had a vision. And he wanted to take advantage of the place that spoke to him the most. And you can see in this next photograph what it looks like to stand on the terrace of this house. And I was very lucky that I spent a week here researching this book and we got to stay um, in the Villa Astor. It's like the Amalfi Coast is, for my money, the most beautiful spot on the entire planet. It just takes your breath away. This is actually the entryway much less impressive you come up from um, the street in the town of Sorrento. When you go inside though, what you see what Astor has created, almost everything you can see here are things that he found in the garden, almost all of them ancient Roman. And he, he, he left such a legacy, but it's been enhanced by the current owners who bought it in the early 2000s. And they hired the famous um, French designer Jacques Garcia to do the interiors over. So this is one of the bedrooms. I know it looks like a French bordello, but it's very much in keeping with the idea of a Pompeian fresco. And that's what you see here on the walls. Each of the bathrooms that attaches to the bedroom were redone in a different stone. And each of the bathrooms has a tub carved out of one single block of marble. In this case, it's black marble. These bathrooms, the bathrooms alone, just make me swoon. You go outside to that famous terrace that overlooks the Bay of Naples. And what you see here is an arrangement that William Waldorf did of bits and pieces of ancient statues and 19th century things he recreated to give you this vista. If we zoom in on the, the one on the left, you can see this great vista. That's Vesuvius there in the background. I mean, if that doesn't give you chills, I don't know what will. One of the artists that's always intrigued me the most is the Anglo-Dutch artist, Lawrence Alma Tadema, who was famous for painting these scenes of ancient Greece and Rome. And you see here um, a painting he did in 1895 it has that same Mediterranean feel, that same blue, that wonderful sense of being in, in a, a magical place blessed by the sun. But what I love is with the arrow that Ginevra has just shown you is the, the detail, how high up they are. That's the Roman fleet coming home that these women are looking at. We're not that high here at the last, but we're pretty damn high. But that wasn't enough for William Walter Baxter. He wanted great gardens. He loved gardens. Because he was afraid of being kidnapped, um, he wanted gardens that were completely enclosed with high walls. He built these amazing gardens here. These are considered some of the finest gardens today in Europe, but this wasn't enough. So he bought villas next door, tore them down, and expanded his gardens. And you can see here, um, he incorporated fragments he found in the ground into these gardens. These are ancient Roman bits and pieces. And because this had been a convent, because the convent had saved the space, he also incorporated things that were Christian into the gardens as well. But as I said, this wasn't enough. He wanted more space to walk. And he had visited Pompeii and he saw the House of the Veti, which you see here. And he decided he would like one of those for himself. So he, in 1910, had this built. This is the beginning of the Villa Flores. This is in the land he bought that's adjacent to his garden. This is a view of it from the Bay of Naples looking back. And this is the completed view, looking out over Vesuvius again. But look at some of the pictures of the interior of this place, which is astonishing for its accuracy. Um, the next one, I think, is just even more amazing because these appear to be murals from Pompeii. And they were so well done that archaeologists who saw them thought they were original. And of course, they were all painted in 1910. This has been sold away from the Villa Astor. This is now actually a restaurant, so you can go and eat there. Before the current owners bought it, it was owned by an Italian family who entertained the great and the good of the time. This is Princess Margaret at the Villa Astor. Here we see Pavarotti. 
Gregory Peck, and last but not least, Pierce Brosnan. So some of you may know that in 2017, I was lucky enough to be a co-author on this book, Bill Astor. I wrote about um, Villa's, I mean, I'm not Villa's, the Astor's great love of everything English. But my co-author, Suzanne tease Ozare, she here leaves, I think, the best words for us to remember Astor. In his writings, building projects and gardens, Astor was always searching for a distant golden age that could provide solace for what he considered to be the ugliness and cruelty of the world around him. Inspired by Roman history, ancient Roman gardens, and medieval cloister gardens, William Waldorf clearly considered the garden he created at Villa Astor as a kind of sacred grove, an idyllic antique retreat. And for the ultimate retreat, I leave you with a photograph of my cat, who's retreating right next to me as we speak. Thank you guys very much. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Kurt, for that fantastic and entertaining presentation. Before we get to your questions, I'm excited to invite you to some upcoming programs. So next Tuesday on July 11th, join us for an American Inspiration virtual event with author and the nephew of famed chef uh, Julia Child, Alex Prudhomme, as he discusses his new, his new book, Dinner with the President, Food, Politics, and a History of Breaking Bread at the White House. Hear about the sometimes curious tastes of 26 of America's most influential presidents. Then on July 27th, we will honor two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian Alan Taylor at our summer benefit at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. And then on Tuesday, August 8th, hear about the robust summer artist colonies on the shores of Cape Cod and Cape Ann with authors, historians, and curators Ike Williams and Elliot Bostwick Davis. And to learn more about these programs and see other online and in-person events, go to American Ancestry org slash events. All right, so let's get to some questions. Go ahead and type your query into the Q&A panel. Um, I love this question. Um, Patricia asks, did anyone ever, in fact, try to kidnap him? Not that I know of. Um, he, he was, as you can probably tell, a, in my mind, a sad and lonely man. Um, and he, he, this shows you what great wealth does. I mean, it, it, it can be, it can make you a prisoner. I think he was a prisoner of his wealth. One of the things he liked the most about coming to Sorrento is that the Italians, um, weren't interested in him because he was rich, which is sort of astonishing. And they left him alone by and large. Um, so he felt he could be the most himself when he was in Sorrento. Um, but no, I don't think anything ever was attempted to kidnap him or his children or his wife or anything like that just a paranoid fear he had. Hmm. Um, Nick asks, what in your view differentiates him from his peers of the time? Um, well, I, I think I probably alluded to that very briefly earlier that I, th I think, well, first of all, you know, he was not social in the way I, I'll use the two examples I mentioned before um, of JP Morgan and um, William Randolph Hearst. They love entertaining. They love being around people. They love sharing stories. He, I think, was a misanthrope. I don't think he liked people. He was suspicious of them. He he talked about this when he was older, about how he felt imprisoned by his puritanical upbringing, by his very strict, I think he was Lutheran or something Protestant. Um, and then his discovery, which I also mentioned in the very, I think, first or second slide about how um, discovering Greek philosophy was his conversion on St. Paul on the Road to Damascus. He felt oppressed by American puritanical values. And um, as I say, I don't think he was ever comfortable in his own skin. And he was afraid to entertain because he was afraid of being kidnapped. And he was also not really a lover of people. So he kept to himself. He kept his own counsel. He knew exactly what he wanted. Um, he was richer than J.P. Morgan or, or Hearst. But um, J.P. Morgan was a real connoisseur. Hearst, I think less so. Hearst was there just to build things to brag about them. But um, I think if I put him up against J.P. Morgan, whose taste was more Catholic, I would say that for what he was interested in, that William Waldorf Astor was more of a connoisseur than J.P. Morgan, because J.P. Morgan was interested in so much. Um, I, I think he was a real romantic, passionate man who lived in the wrong time. He lived in the wrong century. He, he would never fit into the world that he was born into. 
thanks. Um, Jocelyn asks, you know, you mentioned that his his wife died at a rather young age. I think you said around 36. Um, Jocelyn asked, did he share his did he ever share his life with anyone, male or female, after that? Um, not males that we know of. He was rumored to have had affairs, very brief affairs, um, but he never gave up the love for his wife. And I think that was probably a hindrance to him actually ever loving anybody else. But I also think that he was suspicious of other people as he was about everybody. And that includes women getting too close to him because they would want his money. And he and his wife had a very close relationship um, that he trusted her in a way that I don't think he felt he could ever trust anybody else. And, you know, I think how we might analyze it today from a modern psychological standpoint is that he probably felt he wasn't worthy of love. He was such an unhappy person. Um, that's that's it, full stop. Unhappy person, difficult, loving. He, it, he, 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 he tried to control everyone's lives that he was involved with his children. Um, he became very close to, I can't remember her name, but one of his daughters who sort of became like um, his hostess, his, his partner, his wife. She, when, when he would have dinner parties, um, she would host. But oftentimes he, he wouldn't even come to the parties or if he came, he would leave you know, halfway through and go to his room. Um, so he, he was he was a difficult person. And kind of continuing on in these interpersonal relationships, Ruth asks, what was his relationship with his son, um, Nancy's husband? It probably won't surprise you to hear it was rough because he was impossible to please. I mean, it was good for a long time. And then I can't remember what happened, but something happened. And when he died, he died in 1919, I believe, at the age of 71. Um, I don't think he was speaking to Waldorf, his son, when he died. And I don't know what happened. It's not a, it's not a secret. It's easy to find out. But, um, you know, he, I think he thought because he gave him so much, and he did. <laughs> he gave him millions of dollars. He gave him Clifton. He gave him jewels. That I think he sort of felt that he bought his son and that when Waldorf, who was a very milquetoast person, which you'd have to be to be married to Nancy, um, stood up to him, which happened late in life, that was, I think it signified to him ingratitude, and he couldn't forgive that. Um, and a few people are also asking about what happened to his children, and do his descendants today have any kind of connection to some of these houses? Um, well, um, yes and no. So um, Clifton, as I said, is owned by the National Trust, and it's let as a hotel. Um, Heber Castle is a tourist attraction that's owned by a family in Yorkshire. And you can see, so the castle itself is a tourist attraction, and then the Tudor Village is a hotel. Um, the Villa Astor is owned by a Russian couple now who let it, I want to say, for 150000 a week, something really high. Um, and there's not much money left. I mean, you know, generations spin it away. There are the 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 um English branch of the family has two Lord Astors. There's I think a Viscount Astor and a Baron Astor. And one of them, um, I'm looking at his um name right here, the Lord Astor of Hever, he um wrote the introduction to this book that I co-authored. And he's the Baron, he's Baron Astor, and he sits in the House of Lords. Um, you know, they're comfortable, they don't have a lot of money. Um, and someone asks, how did he become a Viscount, since he was descended from a German butcher? <laughs> did he pay well, for it? Or <laughs> yeah, Basically, yes. I mean, you know, there, there have been scandals up until this very moment, um, what are called, um, you know, peerage scandals, which is peers for sale. I mean, you never buy them outright, because obviously that's against the law. You do what people have done for centuries, which is you use money if you have a lot of it to do things to bring yourself to the government's attention, to the people in power's attention. You find out what the prime minister likes, what his favorite charity is, and you make a large donation to that charity. Um, and that's sort of what I alluded to earlier when I was showing that Titian that he had contributed um, a large amount of money to buy that was very much seen by the political savage. Like, that's very nice of him to do. He also, um, during World War I, 
um, built and paid for hospitals that impressed the King George V and George V, who's the one who officially gave him his title. Um, so I think, yeah, you could say he bought his title, not, not in an illegal way. He just, he used influence. He he gave lots of money to British charities. He turned he turned his back on America, which I'm sure made the Brits happy. He gave an enormous amount of money to things that mattered in British life. And it wasn't just charities. As I said, he also had newspapers. He pumped a lot of money into the economy. Think what it costs to have 800 men dig a lake for you at Hever Castle. What that did to the economy. He built temporary villages just to house these workers. And so that created jobs, just the building of the villages and then the people coming down. So he had huge employment and he paid better than anybody else. And he um, he also was generous. I remember reading somewhere that at Christmas time, everyone got a turkey who worked for him, like 800 laborers. So he, he did a lot to make himself um, popular with the British public at large, building um, his townhouse, Astor House. That was a big cause celeb. It talked about all the time in the papers of the time of what was this going to be like. And when it when it was finally done, he had parties that he usually didn't attend to open it to show it to, to British society. People were just amazed at the money he spent and how how much he was respectful of British history, how much he incorporated into those things. So I I I think it was two things. I think he he wanted a peerage. Um I also think that he did it because he really loved it. I mean, he, he he felt at home in British society in a way he didn't in American society. So I, I think it worked both ways. And as, as I'm saying this, I'm remembering, I think one of the things that had him start stop talking to his eldest son, Waldorf, was that Waldorf didn't, let me get this right, it's coming to my little brain bit by pieces. Waldorf was a member of parliament. And he said to his father, I wish you hadn't accepted a peerage because when you die, I'll become the next peer. And as I'm sure you all know, if you're a peer, you can't sit in the House of Commons and the House of Lords where peers sit doesn't have any real power. And um, his son wanted to be in the House of Commons and his father thought that was, that was very ungrateful, that he'd worked really hard to, to get this peerage and that his son should be happy to accept it. Um, and I believe that was the, the nugget that turned them against each other that just sort of grew. And I think past resentments came out as they often do um, in families, and it just became a, an insurmountable ball that um, that they could never undercome and never overcome the resentment. Um, and Mary asks if you can kind of repeat or recap what was you know what was the specific disillusionment that really prompted him to abandon the U.S. or turn his back on the U.S. as you said. Oh, his his aunt. Um, Mrs. Astor. I mean, that's certainly the, the 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 seminal event was the losing of the war of to who's who would be the leader, the female leader of New York society. He also felt, um, I said earlier that he was thin skinned. When he was a politician, he was criticized as politicians usually are and always have been. He took that very seriously. He he never never forgot a slight. Um, and then he was ridiculed in the press. Um, after he left politics just for being so rich. And he, a lot of his properties in Manhattan were, uh, let's say he, they would, he would qualify as a slumlord. So he didn't maintain his properties terribly well. So he opened himself up for criticism. Um, and every time the criticism came out, and because he was the richest man in the world, um, everything was amplified in all the newspapers. So he felt betrayed by his country because he had this aunt who had outwitted him. And then he had this country that seemed to be unappreciative of all the money he was pumping in. So, you know, basically as they would say in the UK, he, he threw his toys out the pram and picked up his bits and pieces and said, you know, screw you America, I'm gonna go to a country that'll appreciate me. And they did, which was key as well. I mean, if they had treated him the same way, that the Americans did, I think it would be a different story. I think a lot of the reasons they treated him differently was because one, he was a curiosity, this American who seemed to really want to be British. And it helped obviously enormously that he had so much money and that he was willing to spread it all over the UK. Um, just a few final questions. Um, Elaine asks, were any of the of his London estates, were they damaged during World War II? 
We only had the one house in London, um, Astor House, and it was it did get a direct hit, um, and it was rebuilt. So after after his son, I can't remember which son inherited the house, but it it was sold soon after he died, and for most of the 20th century, it was offices, and um, that's when it was bombed. It was I think a corporate headquarters, and now very nicely, it's been bought by a nonprofit foundation called the Bulldog Trust. I think that's their name. And um, they have restored the house and it's um, art gallery, private events. So you can rent it um, for um, cocktail parties, for weddings. As a matter of fact, it's also a filming venue now. If you remember um, when um, Lady Rose got married in Downton Abbey, um, that's where she got married. That's where they filmed that. So I think it's open two or three times a year for public exhibitions. And then the rest of the time it's by um, appointment only. But yes, it, it was damaged during the war and then rebuilt. And Lisa asks, is there a book that you would recommend that kind of goes over that social fight between the Astors in New York? Well, that's a great question. And I'm sure there is, but I have no idea what it is. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's funny because, you know, the Astors were um, old money and the Vanderbilt were new money. Mrs. Astor looked down at Mrs. Vanderbilt. And the Vanderbilts are more famous today. And there are many more books that I know of published about the Vanderbilts than there are about the Astors. But I'm sure there's something out there that will talk about that when the Astros, but I, I'm sorry, I just don't know what it might be. Um, let's see, maybe two final questions. There's so many great questions. Um, <laughs> how did he die? Um, he, he he died, um, he had a house in, um, not, not too far from Brighton in Sussex. And um, I, this is terrible to say, I'm not sure about this. I think he died on the toilet um, from a heart attack by himself. He, you know, by the time he died, um, he he had alienated or pushed people away, and so he was pretty much by himself with his servants. And then finally, Susan asks, um, "Have you or will you ever offer a tour of Sorrento and the villa?" <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great idea. Um, we could not afford to go to the villa with the tour. I mean, golly gee willikers, that would be so much money. Um, I've thought about doing a tour to Sprinto. The problem is um, when we do tours, everything is logistics. So we need to have enough things to do that are clustered together. So there's no more than a one hour drive generally between things that we can fill up a week. So seven days. And there just isn't enough to do for seven days around there. There's a lot of beautiful things, beaches you can lounge around and, and just have glorious views of the countryside. But as far as the things that I do in my tours, which is to take people to cultural places, there just aren't enough of them within a comfortable commuting distance that we can make it work. So um, we've thought about it a number of times, we just can't make it work. But I do encourage everybody to go to Sorrento. Um, I will say as an aside, for those who haven't been there, Sorrento worships the lemon. You can see these houses in the town that have the back have backyards that are probably 10 feet square. That's their whole yard. Every damn one of them has a lemon tree in them. Everybody makes their own limoncello from the lemon trees. You can buy, the, the lemon's like the symbol for this part of Italy. You can buy the tourist shops in Sorrento. They have like porcelain with painted lemons on them. You can get glasses shaped like lemons. You can get lemons on, on your t-shirts. You can get lemons on brooms. It's like this love of the lemon. And I am not really a, much of a drinker, but the one thing that could get me drunk with no problem is limoncello because it goes down so easy. It tastes like dessert, which is how I think alcohol should taste. And it's just heaven. I mean, just being there is heaven. Just having fresh tomatoes. I mean, American tomatoes are just pure crap. When you have a homegrown, homegrown Italian tomato, because when we stayed at the Villa Astor, there was a housekeeper, it's probably in her 60s or 70s, and she came in every day with tomatoes that she had grown herself, and she made these crazy salads for us. Oh, my God almighty. Whew. There's no place like Italy. There really isn't. As much as I love Britain, that's where I'd live in a minute if I could, um, there's no country in the world, in my mind, that has as much as Italy does. Just pure good living. 
Well, thank you, Kurt, for bringing us to the Bay of Naples and helping us beat the heat on this very <laughs> hot summer day. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. If you have other questions, go ahead and contact us at heritagetours at nehgs.org. Thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. Be well, and I hope to see you at our programs in the future. Goodbye for now.